For those of you who may be here visiting family and our guests, uh, I want to let you know that during the four Sundays of Advent, uh, we've talked in worship about the dreams of different people, uh, people in the Bible as well as some of our own dreams. And we've noted that our lives don't always turn out the way we dream or hope. And when we looked at people in the Bible, some of their dreams are pretty similar to some of ours, perhaps. The prophet Isaiah dreamed of peace and an end to war. John the Baptist dreamed of people turning their lives around by turning to God for a fresh start before it was too late. Mary dreamed of God making things right in the world, and Joseph was obedient to God's message in a dream, even though it was at a little bit hard to believe. But all of these dreams are part of God's larger dream for the whole world, expressed by the angels to the shepherds. God's dream is good news of great joy for all people. A Savior is born, the Anointed One, the Chosen One, Christ the Lord. Now, God's dream does not unfold the way we might expect it to if we were the ones running the show. The Savior does not come in overwhelming strength, but in the weakness and vulnerability of a baby. The child comes not to the powerful, but to the oppressed. The child is born in poor conditions, not in wealth or comfort or prestige. God's message is not good news just for one people, or one nation, or one race, or one political affiliation, but for all people. God's dream is peace and not war, love and not hate, compassion and not condemnation, hope rather than fear. God's dream is one of love, and the message is that God is close to us and loves us, and that we're connected to God and to each other in ways we often don't perceive. Most of us associate Christmas with gifts. And hopefully, if we look back on our life, no matter how young or old we are, there may be one or two gifts that we've received at Christmas that we always remember and we never forget. Uh, I'm happy to tell you that uh, Pastor Mary and Dave's daughter, Katie Downer, Uh, who sang just a a moment ago, she got a Christmas present this evening that she'll never forget because Kevin Henry, who accompanied Katie on the drums, is going to be accompanying her for the rest of her life because he proposed to her tonight right in front of our Christmas tree. Kevin did a great job. He had an ornament hanging on the tree. Katie, will you marry me, right? And... A little thing down with a chest with the ring in it. Well, well done. (laughs) Well, I want to tell you about a a special gift I received one Christmas. It's not quite as good as Katie and Kevin's, but... uh, And I've told this story once before, okay? I'm acknowledging. I've used the story before. But Ben has used stories more than once. My dad has used stories more than once. And since this is my 20th Christmas Eve at Brewster Baptist, I can start retelling some stories. And I'm telling this one specifically because this is the first time that my dad has had the chance to worship with us on Christmas Eve. He's preached here before, but to this point, he's always been preaching somewhere else usually on Christmas Eve. So I'm telling it because he's here. And the story, and he knows it as soon as I start telling it. The story begins more than 50 years ago when a couple named Tom and Doris Nelson, who lived in a section of Greater Boston known as Jamaica Plain, uh, Tom was a graduate of MIT, a very smart, successful businessman. Doris, his wife, was a loving, devoted, saintly kind of person. And they were members of the Baptist Church in Brookline. And they had two sons, Tom Jr. and then another boy, Richard, was born. And Richard brought great joy to his parents' lives. And in the early 1950s, Richard became ill. And his parents took him to a hospital in Boston. And tragically, a doctor misdiagnosed what was going on with Richard. And he died when he was three years old, three days before Christmas. A number of years passed. 
And in 1960, the Baptist Church in Brookline called a young pastor named Vic Scalisi and his wife Mary to come and begin their first ministry with them in Brookline. And at the welcoming dinner, my mother happened to be seated next to Tom Nelson. And the two of them hit it off. And because the Nelsons were older than my parents, they looked at my mom and dad as kind of like they looked at their own grown children, the way some of you used to look at me uh, a number of years ago. (laughs) Doesn't happen anymore. And Doris, she had this saintly, serene kind of face. And Tom had more of a hardened face and a hardened look about him. And as the Nelsons got to know my parents better, they shared about the tragic and painful death of their young son almost a decade before. And Mr. Nelson said to my dad, you know, a businessman makes a mistake and it costs $25,000. But a doctor makes a mistake and it changes your life. When I was born, my father said that I was like the apple of Tom Nelson's eye. And he really took an interest in me. He read to me. He loved being with me. And in a sense, my dad said, um, I was almost like Richard Reborn. I was like the child that he had lost. And Mr. Nelson was like another grandfather to my sisters and me. And he enjoyed coming to our house. And he would play with us, especially building with blocks and Legos. And on Christmas morning in 1968, my sisters and I had looked through our stockings that we always found on our beds in the morning, and we had woken up our parents, and we had come downstairs, and we gathered in the living room, and we had read the Christmas story from Luke chapter 2 in the King James Version, just like we did tonight, and we sang a song, and we began to open our presents, and we were doing all of that. Well, my dad, of course, was filming everything with his movie camera, and if you're of a certain age, you remember how bright that light was with that movie camera. You're just, ah! And while we were doing all of this, the doorbell rang. And we went to the door, and I can remember as a four-year-old boy walking over, and we had glass panels next to our door, and looking out and seeing the Nelson standing on our front steps. And so, of course, we opened the door, and they came in, and they had presents in their arms. And Mr. Nelson had a particularly long, rather large present. And we said, Merry Christmas, and welcomed them into our home, and As my father started filming again, Mr. Nelson placed the large present on the floor. And he looked at me with moist eyes and said, this is for you. And I did what any ordinary four-year-old boy would do in that circumstance and ripped the wrapping paper off it and saw the biggest, heaviest, most amazing fire truck I had ever seen. And what I didn't know at the time was that I was not the intended recipient of that fire truck that Mr. Nelson had bought the fire truck and Mrs. Nelson had wrapped it many years before for their son Richard. And when Richard had died, they had kept this prize Christmas present in the attic, wrapped for 17 years. Now, I had no way of knowing as a four-year-old child all that was behind this gift. I just knew I had this wonderful fire truck that I would play with for many years. But for my parents and for the Nelsons, it was a very significant event. And as I got older, my appreciation for the significance of the gift and what it represented grew. And the Nelsons stayed very close to my parents for the rest of their lives. They were always great to our family. Mr. Nelson was instrumental in helping my parents buy their first house. And they rented a cottage just down the street from us in Maine for seven straight summers and were always spending time with us. And the Nelsons died in the 1990s. But every time I see the fire truck, which I still have, so that tells you how old it is. I still have it. Still keep it. Every time I see this, it reminds me uh, not only of the Nelsons and the loss of their child at Christmas when we celebrate the gift of God's child at Christmas. I think of the gift they gave me and what it represents. The love of parents for their children. I'm putting it down. It's heavy. I'll just hold this part. But I think of the love of parents for a child. 
that could keep something for 17 years. You know, I think of the healing that can come from letting go of our hurt and giving to someone else out of our pain. And it represents the possibility of new life that can come, even in the midst of our darkness. And I thought, you know, the image of a fire truck is very, and a very appropriate one for Christmas, and not just because it's red. But a fire truck is used to rescue, to provide deliverance, for salvation from danger. Right? Firefighters risk their lives going into places when other people are trying to get out. And at Christmas, we remember that Jesus came to earth to rescue us from our sins and mistakes. He came to deliver us from the power of death. And he is our hope and our salvation. And he left his heavenly home. And he came to earth. And he faced trials and tests and temptations, even to risk and give his life that we might be saved. It's a great truck. Every year, the Christmas story reminds us that God has drawn close to us through the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And throughout Jesus' ministry, he broke down barriers that separated people from God and from each other. And as the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. One of the things I love doing this time of year is watching a certain number of specific Christmas movies, and one of them is Home Alone. Uh, I'm sure most of you have seen it, but just in case there's one person here who hasn't seen Home Alone, uh, there's a scene in the movie about reconciliation that takes place in a church. And little Kevin McAllister is scared of old man Marley, who lives next door because of things his older brother told him, which of course aren't true. Kevin, if you haven't seen the movie, was left home alone. His family is flying to France, and it's only flying. They realize he's not there, so that's why he's by himself. And so Kevin walks into the church on Christmas Eve, and he sits down in a pew, and he's surprised and afraid when he sees old man Marley get up and walk over to Ah, him. yes. You know, the great thing about movies is things always work out well. And it works out for Kevin, of course, outsmarts Daniel Stern and Joe Pecci, and his family arrives home safely. And the movie ends with a beautiful scene of reconciliation as old man Marley welcomes his son and daughter-in-law and granddaughter with big embraces as they arrive at his home. And it still gets me every time I watch that scene, and I've seen the movie who knows how many times, because to me it reflects our hopes and maybe even God's dream at Christmas for love and reconciliation and hope for us as individuals, as well as for the whole human race. And I pray it would be so for those of us who need it in our own families this Christmas. One hundred years ago tonight, Europe was engaged in the first months of what would become known as the Great War, and later on World War I. One hundred years ago, in 1914, the sounds of Rifles firing and shells exploding faded in a number of places along the Western Front in favor of Christmas celebrations in the trenches and gestures of goodwill between enemies. On Christmas Eve, many German and British troops sang Christmas carols to each other across the lines. And at certain points, the Allied soldiers even heard brass bands joining the Germans in their joyous singings. And at the first light of dawn on Christmas Day, some German soldiers emerged from their trenches and approached the Allied lines across no man's land, calling out, Merry Christmas, in their enemies' native tongues. And at first the Allied soldiers feared it was a trick, but seeing the Germans were unarmed, they climbed out of their trenches and shook hands with the enemy soldiers. The men exchanged presents of cigarettes and plum puddings and sang carols and songs. Some soldiers used this short-lived ceasefire for a more somber task, the retrieval of the bodies of fellow combatants who had fallen within the no-man's land between the lines. The so-called Christmas truce of 1914 came only five months after the outbreak of the war in Europe, and it was one of the last examples of an outdated notion of chivalry 
between enemies in warfare. It was never repeated. Future attempts at holiday ceasefires were quashed by officers' threats of disciplinary action. But it served as a heartening proof, however brief, that beneath the brutal clash of weapons, the soldiers' essential humanity remained. And during World War I, soldiers on the Western Front didn't expect to celebrate Christmas on the battlefield. But even a world war could not destroy the Christmas spirit. For the 100 years since that Christmas, there have been wars great and small raging in different parts of the world. Humanity has still failed to grasp and pursue God's dream for the world with the same passion that Christmas shoppers look for bargains. Looking back, 1968, the year I received this fire truck when I was four years old, was a very difficult year in the United States. Those of you who are old enough to remember 1968 know that is true. In the winter, the North Vietnamese launched the Tet Offensive, which was really the beginning of the end of the U.S. involvement and success in that war. On April 4th, Martin Luther King Jr. was shot and killed in Memphis, Tennessee. And on the night that Dr. King was assassinated, Democratic presidential candidate Robert Kennedy arrived in Indianapolis on a campaign stop. And upon hearing the news, he got up on the back of a flatbed truck and informed a crowd of listeners about King's death. And they reacted with gasps and cries. And Kennedy urged the crowd against bitterness, hatred, or revenge. He called on them to embrace King's message of love and wisdom and compassion toward one another. And tragically, just two months later, on June 5, 1968, Bobby Kennedy was shot and died in Los Angeles, California. Many of the events of 1968 reflected the worst of humanity and what I would call a very small view of life. At our worst moments, we often think in very small ways, and we only think about those who are like us and share a very similar perspective. And we think in terms of colors of skin and differences of language and culture and history and even religion. 1968 was a very tough year, but thankfully at the end of the year, something redeeming happened. On Christmas Eve, three astronauts circled the moon ten times. Jim Lovell, who many of you know from the movie Apollo 13, Bill Anders and Frank Borman became the first human beings to travel to the moon. And as Apollo 8 emerged from the mysterious dark side of the moon before heading back to Earth, a relieved Lovell announced to the world, Houston, please be informed, there is a Santa Claus. And launched from the Kennedy Space Center, Apollo 8 was a mission of firsts. It was the first time the lunar service was broadcast on live television. It was the first time human beings had traveled to the far side of the moon. And the first photos of Earth taken from deep space by humans. And I think God's perspective on things is a little different than ours and a little larger than our own. A little more like this. And this photo was taken by the astronauts of Apollo 8 on Christmas Eve, 1968. And it shows the beautiful blue orb of the earth and the blackness of space. And I've got to tell you something else I didn't know until just the last service. The man who designed the guidance system for Apollo 8 was none other than BBC member Carl Hevert, who passed away earlier this year. And his wife was a worship welcomer at the last service and came up to me excitedly as soon as we were done and said, that was Carl's guidance system. And how he excitedly had watched it on TV and remained friends with Jim Lovell for the rest of his life. Amazing small world. Almost 50 years after 1968, 2014 was a very difficult year. A year to me that had a lot in common with 1968. The world is still plagued by war and violence and division, as we all know too well. 
And in light of the tragic headlines of this year that's drawing to a close, it could be easy to lose hope and to grow cynical and fatalistic. And thankfully, just when we need it at Christmas, the angels show up again and sing an alternative song, a song of peace and love and goodwill, which is for all people. And and once again, we're reminded of God's love for us and the Lord's desire to be close to us. And this beautiful photo of the earth rising reminds us it's such a small world in just the emptiness of space. And it's the only world we have in which to do God's will, just as we pray every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, right? For God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. On November 27, 1967, Stevie Wonder released a song that turned out to be incredibly prophetic about the year that would follow in 1968. And the song was titled, Someday at Christmas. Any of you know that song? Any of you heard that as you've been driving around? If you don't know this song, look it up on YouTube. You know, call it up. You can find it online. It's a great song, especially if you like Motown, which I do. But the lyrics are great. And the lyrics say in part, Someday at Christmas, men won't be boys playing with bombs like kids play with toys. One warm December, our hearts will see a world where men are free. Someday at Christmas, there'll be no wars. When we have learned what Christmas is for, when we have found what life's really worth, there'll be peace on earth. Someday at Christmas, man will not fail. Hate will be gone and love will prevail. Someday a new world that we can start with hope in every heart. Someday all our dreams will come to be. Someday in a world where all men are free. Maybe not in time for you and me, but someday at Christmas time. Someday at Christmas. She's already playing it on her phone right over there. Aren't you? It's all right to admit it. I know what you're doing in the pews, so don't try to <laughs> mess around. And I think it's great that you brought it up and you're already listening to it. I think that's amazing. What a world we live in. It's all right. I could have had everyone bring it up on their phone. We could have all held it up. I'm not as tech savvy as you are, Ben. You know, I didn't think of that. Yeah, we wave it back and forth and turn the lights off. But, you know, that song was done 1967. Here we are again, almost 50 years later. Have we made any progress? God knows, someday at Christmas, maybe the song of peace and goodwill will become a little bit more of a reality. But friends, it depends not just on God, but on you and on me. Let's pray. God, for those who have an abundance of love, of bounty and heart and home, keep us mindful of the world's poor. And lift our voices, may we lift our voices often to you in gratitude, loving God. For those who carry hurts and angers and other heartaches, help us to feel the peace which only you can give and give us the grace to let go of long, burdening memories. For those who struggle with the lack of this world's riches, those who know what unemployment and empty pockets feel like. Gift us with a counting of blessings which are often hidden and far more valuable than earthly treasure. For those of us whose faith has grown dim and whose sense of you seems far away, raise in our hearts a great yearning for you that will not cease and a desire for the truth that cannot be ignored. For those of us who are tired, weary, and worn from a constant generous giving of our lives and love, would you be our energy and enthusiasm, be a great and deep spark of light and happiness within us. For those this Christmas who grieve the goodbye of a loved one and whose hearts are very lonely this time of year, touch us with dear memories and transform the inner missing and heartache 
into a vision of what lies far beyond this time and space. For those whose lives speak of growing old, bless again and again with peace and serenity. And let us know what gentle witnesses they are to all of us who still ponder the meaning of life and growth. And finally, save your God for those with young eyes. Keep their hearts full of wonder and joy and thank you for slipping some of their delight and excitement and simplicity into our own hearts each time we celebrate Christmas. We ask all this in the name of our blessed Savior, even Jesus Christ. Amen.